We had lots of questions about how the actual .git folder works in Git repositories, because that's doing kind of all the magic, you might say. And if some extent, it does seem pretty crazy magical, like it's doing something very special. But when you start to look at actually what it's doing, it's pretty simple and pretty efficient, pretty quick. And it's kind of nice how it stores everything that you've done in the past. If you wanted to investigate it yourself, which is pretty easy, you can just list the files inside the hidden .git folder. So it's a bit of work to find it, but then you could just look inside it and see what's in there. And there's quite a range of things. There's like a, something called head in big capital letters, which is really just a link to a point in your structure. And that is just a quick and easy thing that it can always reference to get to the latest point. And if you choose to look somewhere else, then it will just move that link to wherever you want to look in your history of all your files. There's some things called like config, which is a folder which has you know, a range of configuration details like your username you're logging in with and um, the kind of details about your project, that type of thing. There's um, a log folder, and that's something that's being created on the fly, which you can, so if you type in git log, you can see that log list. And it's basically storing metadata about every commit you make. So that's kind of like a, a summary of your history, which you can pick up very quickly. Um, so just so it can display that to you, basically. And then the real kind of important bit, I would say, there's lots of other things in there which we could talk about, but the real important bit is the kind of objects folder. And this is all your past versions of stored files all compressed into this folder in different subfolders so they can be quickly found and picked up again. Uh, and so when you do a git commit, what it does is it takes all your current files, compresses them with the zlib library, and then just stores them in, the, in those folders and uses SHA1 hashing to get a unique name for that particular object. It creates three types of objects, basically. One is it creates an object for the commit. Uh, one, it creates an object for a view of the folder. And then the other one is it creates an object for each file. So if you really want to see what's happening then, you can use something called git cat file, which is just a command. So it's git cat dash file. And then if you do minus T as a flag and then put in the hash, then it will tell you what the type of that object is. The fastest way to get and start to get familiar with it is um, to start off with git log. So if you type in git log and you'll see like a history of your commits and you'll see that one of the things you get there is like a long hash, which I said you get a unique hash for every commit. And you can copy that and you can type in git cat dash file minus t and then type that hash in or paste it in. And that will tell you, for example, that one is of type commit because you've put in dash t for type. If you want to see what's actually in it, you can do git cat file minus p and then the hash and it will print out the contents for you basically. So you can see inside that you have a few hashes and a few other bits of information like who it was that created the commit, which was me in this case. And then it has a git message in there as well. And that git message is what you said was the description of that commit when you produced it, uh, which I just put as testing to in this case because I was testing. So if you then want to see the content of that commit, like all the files you had, you can take that uh, tree hash. The other one is called parent hash and the parent hash is like the previous commit. So if you want to go backwards in time, you could do it that way if you wanted. But the tree is the object, which is the view of the folder. So you can do git cat file minus t for that new hash. And it tells you it's a type tree. So we know this is a tree view of your folders. And you type the same thing again, git cat dash file minus p to print out and it will show you the contents and I'll tell you I've listed two files and each one's got a unique hash as well. And that unique hash is a re reference to a compressed version of the object. So if you want to see what's inside that object, first of all you can do git cat file minus t to see what type it is and it'll tell you it's a type blob because it's a file, compressed blob of data and then git cat file minus p for that will just print out the contents of that file for you. So you can see it's pretty simple, it's compressed an object, it's made a text file view of the folder and compressed that as an object and then it's created a new git commit object, which is just a summary of information it uses, and then compress that. <laughs> What's interesting though, is that it stores it in a kind of unique way. If you look inside the objects folder, which we could do, so if we ls to have a look right now, let's clear it for interest sake. So you can go into objects and list that out. And you can see that it's got a few kind of like subfolders, which are the first two characters of any of the commits. Um, and then if you look inside one of those, like with C81, for example, you see there's shortened file names for the compressed objects. And that's really only doing time saving in terms of finding those objects again. So when it's trying to call them up, it means you don't have one folder with everything in it. You've got some subfolder structure for optimization. 
So, so, but that's where all those things are being stored inside that objects folder. It's managing all this stuff. It's, it's probably got kind of root access or something, has it? I mean, how, how does that work in terms of security? So that's a good question. I don't know the full detail, but Git will only really work within the folder that it's managing. Um, so if you, it won't, it won't do anything with the parent folders and it won't do anything with other projects it's not in charge of. It will just manage the folder that that .git file is in the root of and all of its children. So it will stick within that remit. But you could have, you know, 100 folders on your computer, each with its own uh, .git folder inside, which is managing just the changes within that folder project, essentially. And one thing I often do when I'm showing what's happening is I uh, create a Git project on my computer somewhere, any folder, push it to a server like GitHub or GitLab, and then just go to another part of my computer anywhere, and then uh, do a Git clone of the folder down onto there. And then really, you can like edit in one place, commit it and push it, and then pull it down to the next place to see what happens. And you can see it updating, basically, the content in the two places. Um, and then if you want, you can do some clever things like change both places separately and then try and push them both up and see how Git handles those kind of clashes, basically. They're called uh, Git more conflicts. What does it do in those cases? Usually ask you, does it? Well, very good question. It does a few things. If it can, like if you edited different files in different places, it will just merge them for you and say, you did that, you did that. You know, even within the same file, you edited the top 10 lines, they edited the bottom 10 lines. I can just, I can do that for you and it puts them together. Um, but if it can't, then it says, okay, here's one file that has both of your changes in it and you tell me what it should do. So in practice, it's quite complicated. Um, if you, on one side, on the left, you make some file changes and uh, push it to the server. And then on the other side, on the right, make some file changes and push it to the server. The second one, it will say, no, you can't do that because someone else has put some changes in that you haven't seen yet. And it forces you to get, pull them down to your computer. And then it will say, okay, you, uh, we've pulled them down and here's your file joined with what someone else did. And it basically puts them side by side here. And it says, as a human, you're smarter than me. So you tell me which of those two I should keep or merge them together. And you basically just delete the metadata in between. And it will, um, and then create a new commit. And then you can push that to the server and it says, okay, thank you. I accept that because no one else has changed anything. We're interested in what happens in one more folder and that's the index folder. And what that folder does in general is that it stores what's going to be your next commit. So say you are creating a new file and that's going to go into the next commit. When you git add that file, it essentially stores that information in the index, knowing that this is going to be part of the changes that are in the next commit. So then when you do type in git commit, it takes that current status from the index file and uses that as the source of information for your git commit. The real problem is when 20 people are trying to edit the same files at once and everyone's doing it before you do and you always have to merge. So you, you imagine there must be some communication within team members. And we could do a whole video, I think, on teams using that type of stuff together. D, E, so D and E are children from B. So let's move that around. So D and E and so on, right? So that's fairly straightforward, right? Now, we actually do technically split again. Uh, I think Mike's um, going to demonstrate this in a second. It's that log4j is like milk. It's like water. It's everywhere.